next to you. Hello. Hello. All right. Looks like you all made it. That's awesome. I barely did. Um, so now we have a very nice projector with a screen in a strange room that will be here for a day, and then we'll be back for one day on Monday for our regularly scheduled program. So on Monday, um, I, you have, an, I'll send out a bio before class, but you'll have a guest uh, lecturer on Monday, Joaquin Puentes, who is a, um, leads a penetration testing group at a company called Early Warning here in town. So he has is he hired- Is Early Warning? Huh? Are you giving us some early warning? I am right now, yes. <laughs> Consider this your warning. So uh, Joaquin is awesome. He's an amazing speaker. I've seen him speak many, many times. He's done both physical penetration tests where he has to break into buildings in order to um, get to a certain floor and to prove that he can bypass their physical security, as well as like digital pen tests and more of the things we think about of security, computer security pen, pen tests. So. He's going to be awesome. He's a great resource. Those of you who are interested in a security career, he is a hiring manager at his company, so he knows what things and what skills it takes to get a job. So um, that's going to be awesome. So that'll be on Monday. And then on Wednesday, we'll have a CTF. We'll be back in the room that we were in for the original CTF. What is it, EDC 111? 117. 117. Yes. So, uh, but you know, we'll send out information about that, but I wanted to kind of prime the pump prime the pump for now. And I'm super disoriented because none of you are in your same spots. <laughs> so, and I'm on the other side of the room too, so it's like everything's backwards now. All right, so let's dive in with the time that we got left and figure out what we, because well, we have some really cool attacks to get to here. So um, we've been talking about a number of vulnerabilities that can occur when a C, C code is either, we looked at file system attacks, so we looked at what kind of attacks can occur against the file system. Um, we've looked at how manipulating the environment, an attacker can manipulate the environment of a set UID application in order to trick it to do things that it's not supposed to do. The other um, major class of vulnerabilities, so command injection, we're gonna look at it right now in the context of binaries. But this is a class of vulnerabilities that exist all in all kinds of places, in the web, in a lot of different uh, locations. And the idea here is we talked about, so how does the system libc function work? It, but how does it do it? What, what does it actually do? So you call system with some command. What does it do? What is that? Somebody's gonna, you're going to have to raise your hand. I like blue. Yeah. So it, talk loud. it runs that command with shell, and then it returns the. It doesn't return, but actually. So it actually ends up calling exec ve of slash bin slash sh um, sh dash C and then the command, right? So those are the exact, I mean, the, that's including arg zero. So arg zero is usually the name, so that's SH. So the idea is what happens, so we've looked at cases like file system. So we looked at what happens if an attacker can control part of the path where you're looking to open a file. And we saw that with using characters like dot dot that are special in the context of looking for files in a file system that the attacker can trick you into opening files that you didn't think you were opening. And that's really the theme behind a lot of these styles of vulnerabilities. So uh, for instance, here for command injection, the idea is what would happen if you take user input and you pass it to construct the command that you're, that you're creating with system. So when would this type of thing happen? You're writing some application. You always have to put yourself in the mind of the developer. Like when would they pass user input to a call like system? File names, maybe? 
file name. So like what? So like what? What program do do you want to call and pass a file name to it? I don't know. I'm just yeah, like, yeah, like let's construct an example. Okay. So. I, mean, I don't have to keep like a contact example. book. Contact. Like a contact yeah. book. So some kind of contact book application that you pass in a username and it may be and it has a search functionality. So it's using grep for this would be two cases. One, the name that you're looking for, and two, the search terms are part of that grep command. So. When you're writing this, you'll write, usually a developer will, yeah. All right, just a second, I need to pause this. Back in it, okay. So, the idea is we're gonna write something like system. We're gonna do, so, uh, we'll just put it at the bottom. So we want to do some command, and so how do we build up command? Well, command is basically going to be, and now I'm going to write pseudocode, so I'm not going to write C code because I don't want to have to do all the string copies. I'm going to pretend we're in a language that has uh, string concatenations as a default functionality. So, so let's say we want to grep, so what's the syntax for grep? So we want to grep dash r. What do we want to search for? We can do dash E, and then we will concatenate this with, let's say there's some search variable, some search variable that came from the user, and then we're concatenating it, that again with, what's the file we want to grab? Skeleton. Hmm? The skeleton file. Skeleton? Wait, what? ETC skeleton. Okay, sure. We'll, we'll do ETC, well. Let's do like var book. We'll call it book for address book. Okay, so here we have our command where we're concatenating strings together in order to create the value that we want to pass into system. So the first part of command is the constant string grep space dash r space dash e, and then appended to that is search, and then uh, which is some user input, which is the search term that the user wants, and then after that we're appending the the folder we want to look in, which is like bar slash book. Uh, is it difficult to see the screen with the lights on it? In the back? Okay, I see heads shaking in no direction. Raise your hand if that's not the case. So, so let's say, actually let's make this more clear. Instead of search, we'll say this is argv1. So argv1 is going to be the first argument that's passed into the function on the command line. What's argv0? the name of the file. It's normally the name of the file, but we've seen when you call, how do you execute, what's the function that gets the system call that gets invoked when you execute a new process? Exec VE, and what parameters does it take? A file name, so a path, an absolute path to a file, and then what? An argv vector and then an environment pointer vector. When I say vector, I mean a character pointer pointer, right? A pointer to an array of character pointers. Both of those are null terminated. So when you go through it, you can actually you'll see that um, the exec ve doesn't say anything about argv zero having to be the name of the program. It can actually be anything um, because whatever's invoking it. When you um, does that, when you use something like system, when you use a libc command, it's going to make sure because that's a convention, but it's not a standard. It doesn't have to be that way. But when you're writing code and you want to use the first argument on the command line, you're going to use argv1. So, so what characters are special in a so, and we know, okay, so we just said, let's go actually a little bit forward. So this is the user code, right? So we know that this code is written by the user, right? Is in the program, is compiled into C code. And we know based on our study of the man page of system, we know that system will do a bunch of stuff and then eventually call execve with bin slash sh 
And then it will call the argv vector will be, I'm going to draw it like this, so it's like brackets. So uh, bracket syntax. So the first argument will be the string slash bin slash sh without the trailing a, uh, slash. Uh, then it will be sh, and then I believe dash c as the second parameter. And the third parameter will be our cmd. And whatever it'll be for the environment, I don't know. I think it'll copy it from whatever the current environment is. So, what does bin sh dash c do? What happens when you normally execute bin sh? It opens up an interactive shell, right? It's essentially, it's the shell, that's what sh stands for. On most systems, they're linked to dash or bash, so they're essentially actually the same thing. Um, so then what does the dash c flag do to sh? What was that? Does it prep it for a command? Yeah, so it means that the next argument after dash c is some command. Execute it as if you executed this on the command line and then exit. So I think we can look at this real quick. All right. Let's see if my host, of course, this doesn't work. So we're doing man, uh, what is it, sh? Okay, so it's definitely lowercase c, based on what I just saw. So dash c says read commands from the command string operand instead of from the standard input. Special parameter zero will be set from the command name operand and the positional arguments, dollar sign one, dollar sign two, et cetera, set from the remaining argument operands. So what this means is that the shell will parse whatever that string is according to the shell parsing rules to figure out what things to execute. So what happens if we put, let's say not this example, what happens if we put system ls? How does sh know which ls to execute? What was that? Yeah, what, which environment variable? Path, uses path. So how do you execute multiple commands in one line on Bash? Semicolon, well, multiple ways. One is semicolon, right? So you separate each of the commands by a semicolon. What are some other ways? Double and. Double ampersand. So double ampersand, right. So like an and, same thing with double pipes is two, is an or. Um, what else did we say? Somebody said something else. <coughs> There's back ticks. Have you seen back ticks? No. What does that mean? No, not quite. No. Man, I get the whole screen back. This is awesome. Should have done this earlier. Okay. All right. So we can do ls. So what does pwd do? Yeah, present working directory. And how does it look this up? Yes, it uses the current working directory of the executing process. So that's how it figures out the current work, the current working directory. Uh, so we can do pwd. If I do ls backslash pwd, essentially what these backticks do is it means to insert the result of calling pwd and put it and execute it as the first parameter to ls. So it'll be ls, so this should output, we'll do dash la so it'll tell us where we are. Yeah, so it, we can, so this is the same thing as ls dash la slash home slash Adam D with these back picks. So it's doing a substitution of the resulting command inside that result. So how does, the shell or bash do this? It's just magic stuff? Yeah. Yeah, but how does it know what exec CVE or exec DE? How does it know to exec in 
this example, how does it know to exec, eventually call exec VE with PWD and then take the result of that and use that as the argv1 to exec ls, when I had to look up all of those in the environment too. Isn't it looking for those special characters and then acting on the fact that if you see backticks or ands or double pipes, then what you if go I down wanted, the road of What if I wanted to list out a directory that was backtick pwd backtick? Backslash escape. Directory. Escape. Why? Why does it know? Why is there a difference between backslash before this? To who? The system. The system? The system is the broad answer. Yeah. To the shell. Because it has to, so you've taken 340 or compiler courses. I know some of you took it with me. Some of you are probably maybe taking it as an efficiency course, right? What SH is doing is it's all about parsing. It is parsing based on the syntax, so the bash input has a specific, very specific syntax, it parses your input string into its constituent parts so it can figure out where are the semicolons so I know there's two different statements. Where is the uh, back ticks? What about, so I actually don't know if it's in here, if we do man sh, there may be a grammar somewhere. Yeah, so there's a whole section in the man of sh called lexical structure, right? This is telling you that this is a language and sh has to parse this language in order to understand um, what the programmer wants it to do. So because of this, when we go back to our example, what's the intent of the user writing this, this command? Back to our grep, yeah. They want you to they want you to execute not just a single grep command, but what do they want all the parameters to that grep command to be? Alpha numeric. They want, well, they want how many? So they want one, two, three, four. So they want four parameters to grep. They want the first parameter to be dash uppercase R. How does bash know where the parameters are? dash another reserved character? Nope. No? That's only convention. You can, when you write a program, you can use anything. You can use pluses, you can use I underscores. So grep defines what, uh, what it's looking for for arguments. It does, but we saw that exec VE takes in an argv vector that then gets passed to the program. So all types of commands have kind of a parse tree. Yes, but how does it build that parse tree? How does it know to separate the grep from the dash r, so that grep is rv0 and dash r is rv1. Spaces. Spaces. It's all about, so this is again part of the syntax, because the syntax of the sh commands say that the arguments are separated by white space. What if you want to include white space in your argument? You have to either escape it, you can use backslash space, and that will be passed in directly, or you can include it into double quotes, and then you get to a whole host of other issues, like what if you want to include a double quote inside of a double quote? So then you can use single quotes instead, but what if you want to use a single quote inside of a single quote? So there's a whole escaping scenario for that. Um, this is actually a incredibly complex uh, language, so it seems like I'm so happy there's a lexical structure here. So I can just scroll through this a little bit. You can see quoting, backlash, single quotes, double quotes, reserved words, just like a programming language, aliases, commands, simple commands, redirections. Look at all these types of ways you can do redirections. Right? This is actually, so it's often very nice to like actually look at these things from time to time and refresh yourself on um, all the different types of redirections. I mean, the one we're most familiar with is redirect output and then append. But there's all different kinds there. There's um, 
search and execution. So it's telling you exactly how it's going to look for the programs. Probably it's going to talk about uh, the path. Um, path search. See, it's another thing we talk about. Command exit status. What does it mean for a command ex exit status? Uh, complex commands. So you have, this is what we talked about of using semicolons or pipes. Um, pipelines. What do pipelines mean? We didn't even talk about, and the crazy thing is, so an ampersand character can mean different things depending on the context that it's used in. So in this command where it's command one, uh, two, right angle brace, ampersand one, that means, I believe that means redirect standard error, which is file descriptor two to file descriptor one, which is standard output. But an ampersand by itself after a command means run this command in the background and return immediately. Super complicated. And so essentially what's happening here, rather than the programmer, whoever wrote this code that we just wrote, instead of telling exec VE or the system to say, hey, I know this is the program I want you to execute, grep. So we already talked about how this is a problem because of path injection, right? Because of which grep. But even if we put that, we're basically relying on sh to parse our string later into what we mean for the different arguments. So the developer who wrote this code wanted there to be four arguments, one, two, three, four, five, well, technically five arguments to grep, the argv0 being grep, argv1 being dash r, argv2 being dash e, argv3 being what? Yeah, the search string, argv1 from the original program, and the full, fifth one to be slash var slash book, or argv4, which is the fifth one. Yeah. So the question, so now if we can control argv1, what can we do? We can add more parameters to grep. We can add more parameters to grep by adding spaces. So if this was somehow sensitive, right, in the sense that it's, searching for a password, and if it doesn't find that password, it doesn't give us access, we can just add spaces after our search term to give it the directory to do the grep in. What else can we do? So now come up with a new one. You can, you can reroute commands into different files and you can start creating files of your own. With yeah, we could, so not only with, um, so we can create our own commands on the system using semicolons. We can create a new background process on the file system. For instance, listening on a specific port and giving us uh, what's known as a reverse shell, like waiting for us to connect to it. Or that's not a reverse shell, that's a normal shell. Um, we could even create files on the system and we can completely control the content of those files on the file system, right? Because we can do something like echo whatever string we want and redirect that to a file and that will create files on the system of our own content. So if this was the web server or something, we could create PHP files on the system that allow us complete control over it. Um, we can delete any file that the person running this command or the application running this command. Essentially, we have full control over this system, and we can do anything with the permissions of the person running this command. So what if I, so what if instead of writing system, the developer had written exec VE slash I actually don't know where grep is. Which grep? Is it bin grep? Okay, good. Slash bin slash grep as the first argument. And then now we need character pointer array. So then we do slash bin slash grep as argv1. And then we do uh, what we do dash r. And then we do 
dash lowercase e, and then we do um, argv1, and then we do bar book. And let's just put null for the environment because I'm tired of writing. So, so now what is the operating system going to do with this exec DE system call that we just wrote? It's just going to invoke grep. That's going to invoke grep. And what are the argv, what's the argv vector it's going to pass into grep? Search keyword. What if we add spaces into argv1? Grep might not take. Yeah, grep will figure out what to do with that, but will we be able to, let's say here we have one, two, three, four, five, we have five parameters, right? Why, so here, here we have uh, five parameters. Can we add spaces to trick six parameters to appear into grep? Why not? What's the fundamental difference between these two examples? H takes uh, white space or space as uh, the, the character that separates things. And right. It all be it all comes down to the fact that exec VE is the thing that actually creates the process, invokes the process, and passes the environment variables. Essentially, when we call system, we're telling SH to do the parsing for us, and then call exec VE. If we call exec VE directly. We know the operating system is going to do no parsing on our input, right? The operating system doesn't have to think about the different arguments because you've literally already broken it up for it. It's not going to go and reparse things because that's, that's an SH thing. So this is actually something to think about when you're on the command line, right? You're actually talking to bash. You're not even really talking to the operating system. The operating system doesn't care that spaces delineate arguments. Right? All it cares about is what gets passed into exec VE. Cool. So this is the idea behind command injection. If you're building up a command by concatenating strings together and the adversary or an attacker can control one of those strings, then they can completely execute any commands on your system. So this ends up in a lot of places, system, popen. Um, if it's not, if anything is doing any additional parsing, or this can even happen in custom code. You can have custom code that is looking for spaces and breaking it up into argv vectors. Uh, oh, so here's a simple example. So. Here we, we have a main function, so we have int main, int arg c, character pointer arg v, and then inside this we have a buffer of command of 1024, and we're doing an sn printf, which is a printf with a fixed length, so the output will not be larger than 1024. Then we print to command, and we print cat slash var slash log percent s, where per, and then the final argument is argv1. So the idea is printf will then substitute inside that string and copy into the CMD variable on the stack the string cat space var slash log, uh, and we zero it out because we're good programmers, and then we call system command. So this is something that you, what you'd want it to do is that it would cat out whatever log file you wanted, right? This is what we were talking about. It's actually very similar to the example we were talking about. So. Um, you can compile this, run it, and you can do something like foo semicolon space cat slash etc shadow. And it will give you the entire etc shadow file, right? If this is a set UID program, which is owned by root. So you can read any file on the system, you can create any files on the system, and you can execute any commands that you want on the system. So this is, on terms of uh, severity, this is super, like, very bad. Like always, always a vulnerability. Cool. So a real example of this that's super interesting is shell shock. So does anybody remember hearing about this back in 2014? <laughs> that's what I was going to say. But 
didn't want to be immediately corrected by my own blood. Yeah. Yeah. Do you remember? Okay. So yeah. So. <laughs> I already forgot that question. So in September of 2014, they found a new bug in Bash based on how it processed environment environment variables. Ugh. Um, the idea was a Bash program could essentially pass its environment to another invocation of Bash. And so what Bash would do is every time it would start up, it would look through all the environment variables, see if there's any function definitions in the value of the key value store in any of the um, environment variables, and then it would essentially execute that and interpret that as a function. So this was a way of passing a function from one Bash invocation to another which sounds like it maybe was a nice idea. Um, but, yeah, so, but it had to have a certain syntax. So if the variable started with two parentheses, then it would assume that the rest of it was a function definition. And the function definition was passed to the bash interpreter doing exactly what we talked about of doing this parsing. And so by, you could append commands to this function definition to execute arbitrary code just like we saw. So why is this a big deal, or is it a big deal? Does Bash run as a, so yeah, Bash has is really Bash S set UID? Yes. No. No, sorry. <laughs> it's UID. It's okay, running yeah, as you, yeah, right? Okay, That's yeah, the entire yeah, point. Yeah, your, yeah. your Bash is running with your, uh, your user ID, right? It's, it's owned by root, but it's running with your permission. So doing this yourself isn't interesting because you can already act, you're running batch. You're already executing commands. So is this even useful? I hope so. I'm talking about it four years later. It has to be hints. Or maybe I just never update these slides. Does anybody use GitHub? Mm -hmm. What are the two ways you can check out code from GitHub? Download as this. HTTPS yeah. and SSH. How does SSH access work? Isn't SSH the same thing you use to get into a remote server? Yeah, but what happens when you SSH to a remote server, like general? Yeah, it checks the keys, and then what does it give you? It gives you a shell, which means it's executing bash and it's setting the standard input and standard output of bash to your terminal, right? So it's creating a new terminal for you with bash. But here now you have SSH access to GitHub. Does GitHub want you to have an account on their systems? No, absolutely not. They do not want that. They don't want that hassle. But why can you use that to check out code, like check out a Git repository? We're talking about shell shock yet. We're talking about why it's interesting. So, um, so in your SSH uh, authorized key file, you can actually specify that only certain, like when somebody SSHs it, based on their key, they can execute a specific command and only that command. Um, however, it turns out that bash was being invoked and it turns out when you SSH, you can pass environment variables to be set in the bash uh, on the remote system. So basically, you could get full execution privileges as this user on all the GitHub machines. And I mean, so this is anybody who offers any kind of, so we'll call this like a limited access SSH account. So you can break out of that access. Um, the other case that this comes in, so we're not going to talk about CGI applications for a bit, but um, CGI, which is a common gateway interface, is a really interesting um, web API. Basically, the idea is you can write a web application in any language you want, as long as it's an executable. And so there's a well-defined API on how an HTTP request is translated to your program, and it's like the standard output of your program becomes the HTTP response that is returned from that request. So it turns out that all of the, um, 
believe it's all the query strings, maybe something else, maybe the arguments, they're all passed in as environment variables to invoking your program in CGI. And when it invokes this, it's invoking bash is, is getting invoked. And so you could make a request to any CGI web application and get full command injection from without any authenticated web request. Um, so this was a huge deal. Um, yeah, so you could execute arbitrary code through a web request. Um, and it caused like a lot of panic in the security and the web community because now you have to update all these uh, systems. And I believe that this bug was around for like 20 or 25 years. Like Bash had this functionality for all this time and nobody noticed until a few people started looking at the code. Uh, this is another case of essentially user input being parsed and executed as a command. So don't use system MP open, there, especially with untrusted user input. You, so let's say, um, so let's go back to our example that we had of exec VE bin grep, oh no, sorry, the system command. How, can we make this safe? And if so, how? So before we get, the command is passed to the system, we pass it from our and see it. Mm. It's a little tricky though, because then we have to implement all of Bash's parsing logic in our program just to try to see if that thing is safe. Just make sure argv1 is alphanumeric. Yeah, so we can use our whitelist approach, right, and just make sure that argv1 is alphanumeric, which I think should work, because none of the alphanumeric characters will allow you to execute any commands. But what if we want, you know, the users, it's a search term, right? So we want them to use spaces to look for maybe two keywords at once. Like foo space bar, you want to return all documents that have foo and bar. Like when you're using search on Google. So we have to then take a blacklist approach and then try to filter out all the things that are bad. So we talked about one thing we could try to do is we could essentially try to add double quotes. Uh, slash, double quote, and then a double quote. So we can try to add double quotes around, I think these need to be switched. It's double quote and then slash, double quote. So we can try to add double quotes around that string, right, which means that spaces are no longer a problem because the spaces will be parsed by SH as double quotes, like as part of that single argument. But then, Is this foolproof? So if we change it like this, do I sit back and I go, it's done, I fix this? Yeah? What do you call new backslash pin? Uh, new line is tricky. I don't know how bash parses that. Yeah, that could be a way around it. So what would be another way around this? Yeah. You could just put a single quote, like one double quote in the middle string. Exactly. So then your resulting string would be grep dash r dash e double quote, and then a closing double quote that we in input, and then a semicolon, and then whatever we want to put, and then another semicolon, and then some junk after it that maybe won't parse, but you can fix it up to make sure that it does parse. Right? Or you can use new lines or some other kind of tricks. So this won't work. So there is, um, if you want to do this, there is, so the other way is we could use, um, essentially double quotes around the input and then call a function that is known to be good that sanitizes and changes all the, the strings that are important in a double quote context into their escaped equivalents. So for something like a double quote, it'll change it to slash double quote so that it can't break out of our outer double quotes. Uh, possibly it would also do that with new line. It would escape new lines as well. Um, but so that would be sanitization. So the idea being is we're trying to sanitize the user input. I don't remember the function in all the languages, but there is 
most, especially C doesn't have it because it doesn't have anything, but most <laughs> web languages have a function to um, sanitize the input, but you have to read the documentation very carefully because sometimes they assume that the argument is surrounded by double quotes. And so if you don't have that, you're gonna have massive problems. Or sometimes they'll add the double quotes for you, which can also get you in trouble, so you just have to know exactly what's going on and test it there. But fundamentally, the best way to go is to avoid using system, popen, any of these functions, and use execbe and call, or one of the exec family of functions that isn't gonna do any parsing. And so you know there's gonna be no parsing involved. The arguments, uh, because like we said, in the execbe example we had, literally whatever they put in for argv4, they can put in whatever garbage they want with Unicode characters and new lines and double quotes, and it doesn't matter because it's not being parsed. It's just being, the operating system just passes that to grep, and then grep has to interpret it, so. All right. So now we get into the most classic of all security vulnerabilities. So the buffer overflows, overwrites, and this is going to be super fun. And this will be like 100 slides, but I like saying that because there's like 70 slides of animations, if not more, um, to kind of illustrate what's going on. So how are, so let's start at the high level. So how do you write buffers in when you're writing C code? What is a buffer? That stupid thing on YouTube won't. Load your video. <laughs> the a fixed size memory location. A fixed size memory location. So how do you specify it in your C programs? Array. What was that? Array. Arrays. Yeah. So you say whatever type memory type you want in that array and enter a character. You, you I actually don't know the exact syntax off the top of my head. It's like character, name of variable, and then brackets with the size. So if you put that as a global variable, what does the compiler do when it compiles that program? What was that? Yeah, so it'll put it in the global, so it'll create a single address, and it will allocate exactly that much space, and it will be in, as we saw, the VSS segment, right? What happens if it's inside of a function? So you, have, you define some function foo, and inside there, you have a character buffer of 50 or something. Does that get put in a fixed location in memory? It gets pushed, yeah, it gets put on the stack. So we'll actually see very exactly how this happens. Uh, but essentially, the, the, the buffer is going to get put on the stack. And so when you're writing to this buffer, where's the length of the buffer stored? Nowhere. It's stored nowhere. I guess technically you could say it's stored in the compiler at compile time, but once it's compiled, because you can use things like size of with a buffer, but that's only at compile time. And once it's there, right, it's just a memory address, and we saw that the CPU just takes things from memory addresses into registers, computes on them, and then copies them back into memory. So. It's important to understand that there's fundamentally nothing stopping us from, let's say, writing a buffer of length 50 and then saying the buffer plus, you know, buffer bracket 100 is equal to 20. Uh, the other thing we should get over um, is, so let's say we have some C code. We'll have a character buffer called foo of length 50, all right? So if I say star foo, uh, wait, star, then in parentheses foo plus one is equal to 10, what does that mean? The, 
first one, so it'll be foo is at some memory location, and we'll add one to that, and then it will dereference that at that memory address and write 10 there, which is a character, so it's eight, eight bits. Yeah, byte, okay. I wanted to say bytes, I knew it was wrong. Okay, what does this mean? Foo, foo bracket one is equal to 100, what does that mean? The same, what's the difference between the two? Absolutely nothing. There is zero difference. The Actually, the second syntax, <coughs> the foo bracket one, is just syntactic sugar that gets translated to the other way. This is why if you want to do super weird C code, you can do uh, one bracket foo, set that equal to whatever you want, a thousand, and that compiles just fine. There's no errors here because it literally just compiles it to the other thing, and the other thing, in addition, it doesn't matter which order that happens in, and so that's why this happens. So, anyways, this is an important thing to get out of the way. And I can obviously write, you know, I can overwrite, it's just pointer arithmetic, which is just memory address arithmetic. So I can do 100 bracket foo, set that equal to 10, and what's it gonna do? Is this gonna throw a compile time error? Probably not, depending on our compiler. Is it going to cause a runtime error? Why? Not necessarily. Yeah, not necessarily. It depends on what is foo plus 100. If it's been allocated to my program, now you're making me want to write a program that does this. All right. All right, so we're writing int main, and then we have a character foo. Is this the right syntax? Yeah. Like this, right? Yeah. Okay, and then we'll do character foo of 50, a buffer of size 50. We'll do, um, since I told you you could do this, we'll do foo 100 <laughs> equals 10,000. Oh, no, that's not right. We'll do capital A, and then we will return zero. All right, I'm doing gcc wall test.c. So, interesting. That's a warning. Yeah, it's a warning, but it's saying foo is set but not used, but we definitely used foo. Interesting. Hmm. I guess. Operator overload, that's really what it is, right? It's the operator overload with the. I think it's so that's, so that's C. So, C doesn't have any concepts of operator overloading, so it's literally just a syntactic translation from one to the other. The compiler I, doesn't even know how to handle it, essentially. It just first translates it to this other format, and then it compiles it. Um, so that way, they're essentially the same thing. Uh, so I can execute a dot out. It doesn't crash. No seg faults. No nothing. It's crazy, right? But I just overwrote a buffer. But why didn't it crash? You didn't go out of your memory. System. I didn't access memory that wasn't that that I wasn't allowed to touch. Let's. Uh, this is actually fun. Let's. Um, we will take our nice character buffer. We will declare another variable i, uh, and then we will do for i equals zero. Uh, i is less than. We'll do a really big number. I plus plus, and what we're gonna do is I bracket foo is equal to B, and we wanna know where we crash at, so we'll have to do printf uh, percent D slash N I, so this will print out what iteration we're on, because we wanna see how much we can go past this. Um, and we can actually, we can do some other cool stuff. Let's look at, uh, we'll first print out, printf, uh, percent %p, yeah, percent %p is looking at pointers. So this will give us the address of foo, where it's executing at. Um, and the percent %p is nice because it gives us like 0x, so it looks like a pointer. Um, so we can print this out, and then we will access it. Uh, the other thing we have to make sure we're doing is flushing this buffer. I think it's the man page, the F flush. Zero will flush everything. 
It says other Adam, so we'll see if he's right. Do you want the assignment? I do, yes. Uh, not after this. I want it before this. Sorry, I don't usually use Vim, but I think it's every. It's the only thing I have installed here. So. Is that you or me? <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's see where this crashes. Ah, I need to include standardio.h. Come on, where was nobody caught that? No warnings even this time. So we can access, and if we go all the way up, wow, I shouldn't have done like this. Okay. <laughs> Scrolling for days. You can t tell everyone you watch your professor scroll for a long time. So you can see that, um, and this is tricky. Okay, let's actually change this. I want a 32-bit program. Now I'm going to pipe it to less because I learned my lesson. And now we can see that foo is at this memory location, FFA9342A. And you remember we looked at the memory layout, right? And I mentioned that on 32-bit running on 64, it's going to start at the top, right? Everything starts at the top. So we'll first have uh, the environment, which is actually going to be in there. And then we have our V data. And then we have the parameters, argc, argv, environment pointer. And then we have, we'll have this buffer of main. So that is memory location. So we can access all the way down to this time 7,000 past main before we get a seg fault, which is pretty cool. And if you want to dig into it more and see exactly what that address was, you could run, uh, so this is GDB, but I'm running um, this GEF plugin that you can uh, look up, which gives you this nice uh, output here. Uh, so I can see that it's seg faulting here uh, when it's trying to copy uppercase B, which is hex 42, into EAX and dereference it. And the thing you should look at is this is the other syntax. Um, but if I say, uh, if I print out slash X uh, percent EAX, is it dollar sign? Yeah. So we can see we can access up to FFF, F, four F's and E and then zero. So that's how far we can access here. And if we looked at the memory mappings, we could see that that was the segment that was mapped to us and the other stuff is not mapped to us, which is why we get a seg fault. So, um, so fundamentally what this means is we can write code where we define our applications that a buffer has a certain size, but there's nothing in either the runtime or the compiler that enforces bounds checking, that we're not accessing a variable that's outside the bounds of what we've declared. Why is that? Do you have to any program in Java? Do you use arrays in Java? Do you worry about out writing outside the arrays in Java? Yes? Yeah, so arrays in Java, you, if you try doing this example in Java, it will throw a array out of bounds error. So you can try to do it, right? And you as a programmer have to be cognizant of the length of the arrays. But if you try to access or write to somewhere out of those bounds, because in the, I don't know if array is a class technically, but in every array access, it first checks, is this access within the bounds? So what's the downside there? You have to remember what it is. What was that? It takes space. You have to remember your length, which takes space. What else? It's slow. It's slow. You have to do this check on every single read and write operation to every single array. I mean, you think now that's something we don't even think about, but back in the 70s and 60s when they were writing C, uh, this was a huge deal. So how do we get around that in C? So we don't actually store the length of, let's say, strings, right? So how do we know the length of a string? Yeah. Yeah, so we have a standard where we say that strings are null terminated. So essentially, a character in a string could be anything from 1 to 255. But you can't have 0 because 0 essentially signifies the end of a string. 
So this is the key problem. So this, this one, and this is actually kind of crazy when you think about this. So this one, essentially you can think of language or runtime design decision that boundary checking of array access would not happen at runtime. Because of that, there's been huge, I mean, like this is still a massive problem today in real applic. I mean, they find these kinds of things everywhere. Oh, a good, okay, sorry, I just remembered. Uh, going back to command injection, there's a really good bug recently where I think it was KDE environment. If you plugged in the USB drive that had backticks in it, it would execute that as a command because it would, for some reason, pass the name of your USB drive to something that called system, or, or uh, which would then get you to execute anything on their system. So um, I'll, I'll find that link and I'll send it out. But yeah, this is a really good example of this, this case coming up in weird context. Anyways, back to overflows and overwrites. So um, the idea is, as we'll see, so if you think about it, essentially what this means is if you, let's say, are iterating over an array and you use the length of that array not as your own value but as an attacker controlled value, then the attacker can get you to go beyond the bounds of that array where you can start either reading or writing arbitrary memory of the application. So, and that's really at the core of what a buffer overflow is in its essence, is the ability of an adversary to, you can essentially think of as changing memory in your program, and rather than just crashing it, because as we said, yes, an availability attack, yes, that is an availability attack, yes, you got it to crash, but it's much cooler if you're able to take over that machine. So we'll see that by specially crafting what we change and how we change it, we can actually get it to get complete control of the program. Is this related to the, the dirty cow vulnerability that they found? Say it again? Is this workflow related to the dirty cow vulnerability that they found in Red Hat? Uh, I don't remember the details of that vulnerability. I'm going to go ahead and say yes, because it probably is. It's either this or a heap overflow, but heap overflows are just overflows, but that happen on the heap instead of on the stack. So it's all the same type of idea. Uh, yeah, this is, and this is literally the basis of almost every single modern attack. They're just, they're not, the modern ones aren't as easy or simple as the ones we're going to study at the start to study like what, you know, what these things look like so we can get practice doing that. Um, okay, as we'll see, so these are very architecture OS version dependent because you have to think you are overriding bytes inside the memory of a certain process. So have you ever just changed random memory values in your programs? Not on purpose. Not on purpose. If, have you ever had it happen, though? Yeah, weird stuff happens, right? Like not what you'd expect to happen at all. Or it could crash. So we, this will require, successfully exploiting these require a lot of knowledge about what the system is. Is it 32-bit or 64-bit? Exactly how does it work? Um, and the super cool thing is we can, we'll be able to modify both the data of the application and the control flow. So what's the control flow? The order in which things execute. Yeah, the order in which things execute, right? And if we're really clever, we can get it to execute whatever we want and give us access. Cool. Um, there's actually a lot of super cool research work in this area of creating automatic, automatically creating um, buffer overflow exploits. So this was, there is a, um, anybody heard of the DARPA Cyber Grand Challenge? So this was, have you heard of the DARPA Grand Challenge? Just if, you go, if, you, yeah, if you go one fans. up, we've heard of DARPA. But like. well, <laughs> go one more back, DARPA. <laughs> yeah, they're the people who, who gave the money to invent the internet. Um, so the DARPA, maybe nobody does robotics research, the Grand Challenge, yeah? So what's the Grand Challenge? Yeah, so it was like 10 years ago, basically, I think. I think it was 2014 or 2013. Yeah, so think about this. So back in 2006, they had this challenge 
of who can build an autonomous vehicle or even like system, I, I don't think they were very big, that can go off-roading like, a, I don't know, five miles or something. And I think the very first time they did this, almost nobody was able to even finish the race. Like it was, it was pretty sad. Um, but you think about, that was in 2006, what do you see driving around everywhere in Tempe and Phoenix? Yeah, Light yeah up. fully anon like anonymous driving vehicles that are on our road. So, and really that was because DARPA, I think they gave a prize of like a million dollars to the team that competed that the Grand Challenge first. Did DARPA build the dog and all the different animals? I think they fund the people who build them. So DARPA is more like, a, you can think of a VC, like a venture capitalist of research. So they give money to fund ideas that will be good in terms of helping the military achieve their objectives. So, uh, so what they realized is, what if we had a grand challenge in security, a cyber grand challenge? So what they did is they said, okay, so the, um, they, were, they looked at capture the flag uh, competitions, which are where people, humans, try to <coughs> understand a new application, like a binary, analyze it for vulnerabilities and write exploits that they can fire against the other teams, which is stuff we'll be starting to do more and more of as we're, you've done one CTF, we're building up more and more, we'll get to this attack defense stuff later. But um, the, the uh, and what they wanted to challenge the research community with was can we make, can somebody develop a completely <coughs> fully automatic way of playing these CTFs, of analyzing a binary, finding vulnerabilities, but not just finding vulnerabilities, actually developing exploits and launching it at those, at, uh, at the other teams. Uh, completely autonomously, so no human components. So uh, this was a, I think it was a two or three year long project. I actually don't know all the details. Um, so some of you probably know or maybe have heard of uh, Professor Jan Shoshishtashvili. You can call him Professor Jan if you ever talk to him. You don't have to try to pronounce his last name. Um, he actually was leading the UC Santa Barbara Cyber Grand Challenge team. Um, so they ended up placing third in the competition and receiving $750,000. Uh, and the, he likes to say, which is true, that they were actually the best at attacking. So they found the most exploits and on attack score they were number one. Uh, but the way they structured this competition, you got like you could make patches, so they had a defensive component, but there was a whole game theory aspect about your patches would cause you to lose points for one round, and so you had to think about, was that worth it? And he said if they had just not done any patching, they would have won based on their attacking score alone. But, um, you know, that's, you, you can't change the results now. But, um, and so there's a whole series of tools that can find these types of overflow vulnerabilities and automatically create exploits. Um, but in order to even do that, I mean, the still there's very complex, if you look at like what these applications were, a lot of the applications weren't able to be exploited by any of the teams uh, because they require like human intelligence and human thought. So um, yes, so this is a, and not only, so there's been a lot of research on the attack side, but there's been a lot of research as we'll see on the on the defensive side. So really what you see when you look at the history of this cat and mouse game, where attackers say, aha, I can do this exploit thing. And then they say, aha, but now you won't be able to guess memory addresses because we use ASLR. And then the attackers will say, aha, well, I'll break it. I'll jump to libc. And then they say, well, we'll randomize libc and we'll throw in some stack cookies. And then they say, OK, but I can still get around that and all these other things. And I can invent, they invented ROP. And anyways, it's a continual arms race uh, that goes on that's super interesting. So what we're going to start out here, we're going to start with the basics. We're going to lay down some foundations. I'm going to go a little bit quickly through this basic stuff because this is stuff I've actually taken from my 340 class. Um, so, but I want to make sure we're all on the same page here. And then we're going to go through like a historical development of this is how binaries were originally and then they added these defensive things and these are what attackers did to go around that and so forth. Um, so it'll be really cool and you'll be doing these developing, identifying, and writing exploits uh, as part of this course. So it all comes down to the stack. So fund yes? So, so drawing these attacks assumes that we, the application was developed in languages like C++. Yes. So uh, it does, it requires that 
the program that you're attacking is developed in C or C++, but there are, these exist in, I mean, you think about what are large C or C++ applications, browsers, very large applications. I mean, lots of applications are still written in C and C++. Even so, you can find vulnerabilities in the runtime languages, so um, Flash was, is a huge target because it's written in C. Um, the JVM, the Java virtual machine, has had bugs and vulnerabilities in it, so um, yeah, you can, you're not safe and you need to learn all of these principles so that you can understand them. And even, so the other thing, uh, that I'll throw out there is that a lot of applications, like even Java applications for your phone, like Android apps, use native code even though they're written in Java. Um, you can easily include native C code into your app like a library and you can call it through JNI. We did some research to show that like 35% or something of apps actually use that. So uh, yeah, so it's a big deal. I mean, it's still a problem. Yeah. Uh, like a DLL, but like an SO, because it's the yeah. Linux system, yeah. So, yeah, you, they, it's like a library call, but instead of calling it to an Android app, it's calling it to a C. Brian? I've got a question, like, hey, this is a naive question, but, like, all this stuff that we're learning, don't we have to be on the same network as the machine? Yes. So one of the, so it kind of depends. So some of the attacks we looked at, like uh, Path and Home, uh, those attacks do require you to have an account on the system. Uh, but still, those that's like, I think of it as a privilege escalation vulnerability, right? You have access to the system as user foo, and you want root access, or you want user Adam access because I have all the answers to all the tests. So by identifying these vulnerabilities and writing exploits for them, that allows you to escalate your privilege. So in the context of a pen test, if you get to the point where you're on somebody's system, it's much cooler to say, I mean, saying like, yeah, I broke in and I'm the web user on your system, like that's okay. But if you say, yeah, I'm root on all of your sys on your system, like that's much cooler. Oh, and by the way, I can get all your bank account credentials that you have stored in there. Um, the other thing to think about is, so other vulnerabilities like command injection and specifically like buffer overflows here, those are things you can exploit remotely and often they do. So this is actually how you get into a machine when you're completely remote, is you analyze it, you port scan it, figure out what it's running, see if it's running any custom applications or if it's running older versions of some applications, and then sometimes you'll have known exploits and proof of concepts that you can just take and fire at it. Sometimes you may have to write your own. Sometimes you have to find brand new novel vulnerabilities. So um, it's all stepping stones. So you start, start external, you scan, usually you'll be able to hit like the web server, you'll get web server access, and then you want to escalate that to root access and then escalate to other machines on the network. I have a hard time getting root on my own machines. <laughs> Uh, all it takes is practice. All right, so we'll stop here. We'll start with the stack on a week and five days from now.